Well, good morning, everybody. If you have your Bibles uh, or, I guess, devices as well, if you could turn to John chapter 16, verse 16. We're going to jump in in just a few moments to John 16, 16. We've been going through the last eight weeks, uh, this is week eight of our series, um, through the upper room discourse. This is the, the final night that Jesus is with his disciples before he heads to the cross. It's the night that he's arrested. Um, on the next day, he will be nailed to the cross, giving his life for them. And th- this is the final bit of teaching. This morning, we're looking at the final section of teaching. When we start next week, uh, and for the final two weeks of the series, we'll be in his prayer. It's, we, it's called the high priestly prayer, is what it's been called historically, where John is recording for us the prayer of Jesus on that final night, the way he prays for the disciples, the way he prays for us, the way he prays to the Father in this moment of preparation. But John 16 is the the end of the like pregame speech. Jesus is rallying the disciples. They're around together at the table. Judas has already left, carrying out the plot that's going to result in Jesus being arrested. Um, And... Jesus is looking at his disciples, and he's telling them the last things that he's going to tell them before their world falls apart, before everything just feels like they, they've lost everything, all is lost. Before their all is lost moment, Jesus is preparing them, and he's pretty explicit in telling them what they can expect and what they're even going to do and what's going to happen with him what's going to happen with them. He's, he's very specific in his instructions to them, but they're still not getting it. And in fact, we will see them not get it in the passage that we're going to look at um, this morning in John 16, starting at verse 16. Um, but this is the, the, the experiences over the next hours, you know, over the next day for the disciples. They're going to feel like they've completely lost the game. They're going into the big game. It's the big game speech that Jesus is giving them. And then it feels like everything is falling apart. All is lost. And of course, we know the full story that, in fact, this is the beginning. This is the beginning of something new, that Jesus' death on the cross brings salvation to the world. Everything will be different after this moment. They feel like everything is coming to a close for them. But Jesus is preparing them, and even this, even their betrayal, even the fact that they're going to bail on Jesus in his moment of need is part of what God is going to use to bring about the good. He's humbling Peter, for example. Peter, who's so sure of himself, and he knows that I would never, I would never abandon you in your moment of need, Jesus. He needs to be humbled in order to be used by Jesus to lead the disciples and to lead the early church. Anyway, that's the setup. We're going to get into John chapter 16. And we will read our selection of scripture for this morning's sermon. So starting in verse 16, we're going to go to verse 24. A little while, and you will see me no longer. Jesus speaking to his disciples. And again a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again a little while, and you will see me. And because I'm going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. There's a little bit of humor in this, in this story because they're kind of whispering amongst themselves, do you understand what he's saying? I'm not getting it. I don't really understand what Jesus is saying. He says, a little while you won't see me, and I get a little while you will see me. It, in spite of the fact that Jesus has been preparing for them for this moment, and he's been very specific, predicting his crucifixion and even his resurrection, there's three different pr- predictions Um, that we have in the Gospels of him telling them this is what's going to happen, they're still not getting it. I think Jesus used a lot of parables and metaphors, and maybe they thought this is yet another parable or metaphor. 
But Jesus is specifically talking about his death on the cross, but he's doing it in this way that they're not quite clear on what Jesus is talking about. What does he mean by a little while? And then Jesus says, are you talking about your confusion around this? Let me explain it to you. He says, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. And he's, he's talking, we know from the context of this passage, that he's talking about what's about to happen. They're not going to see him for a little while. He's going to die on the cross for them, and then they will see him again, and there will be this moment where everything, everything turns around. I know sermons are supposed to have three points, but I only have two points this morning, so I'm kind of breaking the pastor rule of three-point sermons, but today there's two points of the sermon, and the first one is this, Jesus gives lasting joy. Jesus gives lasting joy. We, we see in this, in this early part of the teaching here, he says the world is going to rejoice. He says you will be brokenhearted, you will be lamenting, you will be weeping, and the world will rejoice. Kylan mentioned this last week in his message, but there's this passage in Isaiah chapter 5 where it says, woe to those who call good evil and evil good. There's this, this moment at the crucifixion of Jesus where he's dying on the cross, and some people are rejoicing. The disciples are brokenhearted. It seems like everything is lost. They, they are in despair as they hear the news, as they know what's going on, and the arrest, and Jesus being beaten, and all of that, and they're despairing, but there's some who are rejoicing in this moment. This evil thing happening is causing some to, to be excited, which tells us a little something about kind of our world. This is something that is a, is a dynamic and is a reality, and it was the case during Jesus' crucifixion. In, in a great turn of events, though, many of those people who are rejoicing are offered the gospel and offered the good news. After the resurrection, on the day of Pentecost, the disciples pour out of the upper room, and they go out there, and they are filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin speaking the message of Jesus to the crowds who are there. And many of those people who are rejoicing on that day they realize the error of their ways. Peter stands up and he says, you put to death the author of life, but God has raised him from the dead. And they, they realize that, hey, we were rejoicing for the wrong thing. And many of those people who were rejoicing on that day end up repenting in that moment and becoming a part of this new thing, the church. Jesus gives a metaphor, which is a very vivid image for us here of what this, what this joy, what this grief turning into joy can look like. And he gives the example of a baby being born and the mother as she's in labor and, and just the Im immense pain of that, right? He says when a, in verse 21, when a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Um. She no longer remembers the anguish, I think is an interesting phrase. It may be like an interesting topic of discussion if we were going to all break up into discussion groups and the moms were going to share their experience of childbirth. It's like, do you, do you truly forget in that moment, you know, when the baby's born, how, how painful that process was? I've been able to see the amazing miracle of, of birth with my three children being born and the incredible privilege of being there at that moment. And what this is talking about is this moment where this, this thing that feels like death, right? I mean, I've been told it's one of the most painful uh, things that you can go through is childbirth, right? And thank you, God, for the wonders of modern science and, you know, things like that, pain-relieving things that can, that can happen. And, and, uh, all. But in this, in this moment, it's incredibly painful, but then there's, there's a moment where the child enters the world and, and the joy that is experienced in that moment is this idea of this pain giving way to great joy, that it feels like death in a moment. He says, the woman feels sorrow because her hour has come. And that phrase, her hour has come, usually when that's used in the scripture, that's Jesus talking about his death. The hour has come. It feels like death in the moment, but something amazing comes from it, new life. He's talking about the resurrection being an example of this and this, this childbirth metaphor being used to describe the resurrection that when it feels like some, everything is lost, there is a death, 
but through, through that death brings new life. I like, um, I like made-up words. Um, a f- there's some words that are just very useful, and I want to give you a few examples of some words that are made up. These are, I found these actually on the Reader's Digest uh, website, um, and I want to introduce you to the first one. So let's put up the first word. So I think you know without explanation what this word means, but it's pronounced phopology, right? And it is, it, what it means is it's an insincere expression of regret, right? Like it's like, I'm sorry you felt that way, right? That's a phopology. I did something horrible. I'm not ready to apologize for it, but I'm sorry your feelings were hurt or whatever, right? How about this one? This next one, expectation. This is the feeling of anticipation when you're waiting for a response to a text that you sent, right? It's heightened by the little bubbles that pop up on the screen as you're, as you're waiting for them to finish typing what they're typing. Um, this next word is destinesia, which means that when you got to where you intended to go, but you forgot why you wanted to go there. That's a great word. We've all experienced that. There's one final made-up word that is, is why I'm bringing all these made-up words up, and it's this one, eucatastrophe. This is a word coined by J.R.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings, which I'm just delighted by the fact that this is not the first time Lord of the Rings has been spoken of from this stage this morning. But Tolkien wrote, he, he coined this phrase, eucatastrophe, which we know what the word catastrophe means, but it's sort of this, this idea in, uh, of a sudden everything falling apart often in a sudden way. And he says a you catastrophe is a reversal of that. It's everything falling into place. It's a good kind of catastrophe that in a moment when all, thi- all seems lost, someone comes to the rescue. Everything is turned around in a moment, a dramatic save the day kind of change. In a time where there is no hope, hope breaks out. Out. This is what Jesus is talking about. He says, you will have a moment where your sorrow will turn to joy. And he's talking about Easter Sunday. He's talking about the resurrection. You will feel like everything is lost, but you will have a joy in that moment that no one can take from you. It's a lasting joy, which is why I said Jesus gives lasting joy. It's joy that's lasting because it's not based on any given moment or a feeling or an emotional kind of thing, but it's based on an event. It's the joy of the resurrection. It is that Jesus rose from the dead. He died on the cross for our sins. He purchased salvation. He rises from the dead, defeating death and our sin, and gives new life to everyone who would come to him. It's, it's a lasting kind of joy. And the, the, the joy is so immense because the contrast between the pain and the joy could not be greater. It's lasting joy, unlike what the world gives. You know, the world can give us something that feels like joy sometimes, but it's not lasting. It's not enduring. It's more like a sugar rush. Right? It feels good in the moment and then is, leaves us miserable on the other side of it. I, a few years ago, five years ago, graduated with my master's degree, and as a part of the, pro- uh, the uh, process, I almost said problem, but a part of the process was I had to complete this giant research project, and Kylan was talking about that, I think, a little bit uh, last Sunday. He's in the middle of that right now. Where I, and, and my topic that I studied, the research uh, project for my capstone project, was about pastors and physical health. And so it was this just something that I was interested in um, and learned a lot of things about it for my own benefit, but also for the benefit of my peers and other pastors. And, and there, there's this dynamic where it used to be historically that pastors uh, were in better physical health than their, the average person at the time, right? Like 100 years ago, pastors had less disease. They, had, they, were, they were in better physical condition. And in modern times, that has changed. And so the, the, the pastors, by and large, are in worse health than the average person in the culture. And I was studying about why this is the case and what can you do to, to prevent that and things like that. And during the course of my study, a- after I completed this giant project, I had to turn in like an 80-page paper. 
Um, and, and then I got to present on it. I got to, at a workshop for our denomination, um, as a part of our conf- one of our conferences, I got to present to a group of pastors um, what, what I'd learned in my study. And one of the things that I'd said to them is that, you know, part of, the, it really boils down to two things. Nutrition and exercise are really the two kind of pieces of it uh, as far as like maintaining good physical health and trying to make sure that you're, you're, you are um, in the ministry for the long haul because a lot of pastors will get so unhealthy that they can't continue to do the ministry that God's called them to do. And I, I want to prevent that. I want to help them to, you know, stay in ministry as long as, as, long as possible. But we talked about the nutrition aspect of this, and it's this idea that, there, hey, there are, there are certain foods that we eat that taste amazing, but they leave us feeling really bad after we eat them, right? Like, you, the, it's, it's, you know the foods that I'm talking about, right? It's the whole pint of ice cream, or it's the whole container of cookies, and it feels amazing while you're eating. It feels so good. But then later you're like, why did I eat the whole thing? You know, it's that, that feeling. And then there's another category of food that you only feel good after you eat that food. Do you know what I mean? Um, it does not feel good to eat the food. You're only like proud of yourself that it's over. You're like, I, 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 I powered through that disgusting thing. And I'm proud of myself because it was very healthy and I did something good for my body. And so I'm proud of myself. But it feels miserable the whole time. It only feels good after you eat the food. I used to drink these green smoothies that were made, they had spinach in them and things like that. And I would just shove a bunch of spinach into the blender thing and add some other stuff to make it palatable. And, and, then, and then one time I was making one of these smoothies and it just exploded just all over my kitchen. And I didn't enjoy drinking these smoothies and I kind of took that as my signal that God didn't want me to drink the smoothies anymore, you know, after I had to clean up this crazy, what looked like an alien exploded in my kitchen. Um, and, and so I've stopped drinking those smoothies, even though they were probably very good for me. I just like couldn't, couldn't chug them down anymore. They only felt good after I ate them. And then there's a third category, which is what I was telling this group of pastors that you should try to have, which is food that tastes good and it's good for you. So you actually, it is healthy, but you actually enjoy eating it. And that most of our nutrition should come from that category, Right. I bring all that long explanation up to say that this idea about the sugar high thing, there's food that we eat that tastes amazing while we're eating it, and then we just leaves us with regrets, and that is what the world's joy is like. It is not lasting, it is not enduring, because it's not based on anything that truly nourishes our soul and gives us what we need. But Jesus says the joy that he offers is lasting. It's it's nothing like what the world offers. Right? He offers something unique and something powerful that, that changes everything for us. And there's this spiritual principle at play here that, that God can take things that are very painful in the moment, the sorrow that the disciples were about to experience, and bring something joyful out of it. And that we know from Scripture that God works all things together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. Right, that, that God can take whatever difficulty you might be facing and bring joy out of it, can bring good out of it. And I think there's this idea that, that through these deaths, through these kinds of things that we experience, come life. And there's a spiritual principle at play here that through our dying to ourselves, get, giving our selves to Jesus and saying, I need to die to myself so that it might, I might truly live, that there's a greater joy on the other side of that. And that sometimes fear about how painful or difficult that might be keeps us from the joy that God has for us if we're willing to walk through that dying to ourselves. Let's continue reading. We're going to read verse 25 through 33, right to the end of chapter 16, the words of Jesus, he says, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me. And have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the Father, or leaving the world and going to the Father. 
His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In the portion of Scripture that we've read this morning, the the second half of chapter 16, Uh, of John 16, we have the story of Jesus in miniature. We have Easter being mentioned, that there's going to be this grief that will break out into lasting joy at the resurrection. And then in verse 28, we have the Christmas story. It says, I have come from the Father and have come into the world, and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. This idea that Jesus, the incarnation, coming into this world... By the way, it's important to notice in verse 28 that he didn't say, I was born into this world for a purpose. No, he says, I came into the world. I came from the Father and have come into the world. This implies a preexistence, by the way. This is one of many passages in the Scripture where Jesus is divine. We see that he is God. He says, I came into this world. I was with the Father, but then I came into this world, and I'm going to be leaving soon. And they say to Jesus after they're hearing uh, these things about his mission, they said, oh, now you're speaking plainly, and we believe. And then Jesus tells them, do you now, do you now believe? He says, the moment is here where you are about to be scattered. You're going to be, you're going to go home, and you're going to leave me alone. But then Jesus says, I'm not going to be alone. I'll be with the Father Even though you all may forsake me, I will have the Father with me. Which, by the way, these words from Jesus should break your heart just a little bit because we know the words he cries out on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That he has the Father with him, but there's this moment that we sing about in that song, the Father turns his face away. That all the sins of the world are being poured out on Jesus. And in this moment, his connection between Jesus and the, between the Son and the Father is broken on our behalf. And the result of this is that we might have a restored relationship with the Father, which Jesus is talking about. He says, the Father loves you. And because you've believed in me, you have this new connection that you will be able to have to the Father. That what it cost Jesus to restore the connection between God the Father and us was everything. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He had this broken relationship so that our broken relationship could be restored and healed. So the second point of my two-point message is this. Jesus gives us peace even in tribulation. Jesus gives us peace even in tribulation. You could say trials if you wanted. That'd be the same idea. Jesus gives us peace even in trouble or trials or tribulation. We get this from the very last verse that we read. He says, I've said, to you that, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, we know what it feels like to have peace when everything is going well, right? When you're sitting in a hammock, like laying in a hammock, and it's a beautiful day in Spokane, right? The sun's out. It's so nice. You're, you're, you're at the perfect temperature. It's the time of the year where the insects haven't realized what season it is yet to come out to bother you, you know? When you're in that moment, work is done, it's the weekend or whatever it might be, or your schoolwork is done for the day. When you're in this moment of relaxation, we know what that feels like. That's a certain kind of peace. But is that what Jesus is talking about in this passage? No, he says, I'm going to leave my peace with you. And he says, it's going to be the kind of peace that you experience in the midst of trouble, that when things are going horribly for you and you somehow feel peace in the middle of that, he says, that's, that's what I'm going to give you. 
There's this biblical concept of this word peace in, in the Hebrew. There's a Greek word that is being translated peace. It's irene, but it's this, the Hebrew concept of shalom, that everything is as it should be. It's that even in the middle of difficult situations, there's a deep abiding peace. Scripture, Paul would go on to describe this as peace that passes all understanding, that will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's the kind of peace that Jesus offers. And how do you, how do you have it? How do you get more of that? How do you experience the kind of joy and the peace that Jesus talks about in this passage? Well, he tells us that in verse 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. So there's something about the teachings of Jesus and the person of Jesus that is the key to having the peace and the joy that he talks about in this passage. He says, in me you may have peace. And I've said these things to you so that you can have that kind of peace. The teachings of Jesus and the person of Jesus, the more we enmesh our lives with that and follow him, and live our lives in a way where we're walking in fellowship and closeness with him. It's what he was talking about in John 15, abide in me. If you dwell in him, you live your life oriented in a way where Jesus is at the very center of it, that's how you have that kind of peace. Jesus says, be of good, let's see, verse 33, take heart, I have overcome the world. And if you put a bunch of different Bible translations together uh, and look at verse 33, you'll have a number of different translations of what that word is. He says, take heart. Others say, take courage. Others say, be of good cheer. But it literally means this idea of taking courage. He says, I want you to be courageous in your understanding of the fact that I have overcome the world. But right before that, he says, Uh, in the world you will have tribulation, which I've called the most discouraging promise of Jesus. The first half of that's not like, that's not the good news part of this. That's the bad news part of this. He says that in in this world you will like win the accolades and the, you know, adoration of of the crowds. No, he doesn't say that. He says, in this world you will have tribulation. It was true for the disciples, it's true for us. That on this side of heaven, there are difficulties that we must walk through. But he says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, why is that something that should give us courage? Why should the fact that Jesus has overcome the world be something that gives us courage or helps us to be of good cheer or to take heart, like this passage says? Why? Jesus overcame the world. I'm not Jesus. How is that helpful for me? If you were a competitive swimmer, but you always came in last at every swim meet, And then Michael Phelps one day stood at the edge of the pool after you've just come in last. And he says, take heart. I have overcome all of these events. (laughs) Say, okay, thank you. That's good for you, Michael Phelps. You're a basketball player who never makes any shots. And Michael Jordan comes to watch you play basketball. And he says, you're not very good at this, but take heart. I have overcome this sport. I can do windmill dunks, you know, I can jump and from a free throw line, or I used to be able to, right? Why is that encouraging? Because Jesus connects us with himself. So his victory is our victory. And I want to read a selection from a commentary that I, I loved about this passage. It says, the basis of this encouragement is important in the balance of the verse Jesus does not say, have, co- have courage, you will overcome the world. The Greek sentence structure is emphatic. Have courage, I have overcome the world. If Jesus has said, have courage, I have overcome the world, and you can too, there would be little good news for us. If a golf master nearly drives on the green from every tee and says to you, have courage, I did it, you can do it too, there is actually no encouragement here. If the superior student performs perfectly on an exam and says to a less gifted friend, cheer up, I did well, so can you. Such counsel only brings a sharper sense of hopelessness. 
if Jesus was, one simply, was simply one heroic man who achieved a superior life, if he was simply a stellar example of what we hope to be, then he has little value for us. We have tried to overcome the world, but we have failed. Jesus' example of superior humanity simply makes my inferiority more unbearable. But if Jesus is more than a human, if he is indeed the son of God who overcame the world, not simply for his own sake, but for our sake as well, for all of humanity, if his victory in his life can become a victory that we enjoy, a victory extended to us when we embrace him in faith, then his triumph can become our triumph. He thus offers us genuinely good news. Have courage. I have faced your enemy and vanquished him. I have fought your battle on the battleground of human experience where you must fight. I have routed the foe. You can never do it, but I have done it. And I can do it again in you. Abide in me and my victory is yours. That's good news. And that's what Jesus is telling us. He's saying, I have overcome the world. In me, you can have that kind of peace. In me, you can have that kind of joy. Listen, how are your peace and joy levels this morning? When I talk about lasting joy and enduring peace in the midst of troubles, are, do you feel that way? Is that what it feels like for you to follow Jesus? Can I encourage you to go deeper? There's more. There's more than maybe what you've been experiencing lately. Find your joy and your peace in him. Walk with him closely. Invite him to be a part of every aspect of your life. Don't hold anything back from him. Give him full rule and reign over your values and your decisions and your goals and your hopes and your dreams. Let him have the leadership over your entire life. And you'll experience that kind of peace and joy that there is no comparison for. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we've been considering together these great promises and these great truths from your word. And Lord, we praise you and we thank you for the salvation that you purchase, purchased for us. And the life that it's possible to have with you. Lord, lasting peace, lasting joy, peace in the midst of trouble. That, that's incredible news, Lord. And I pray for anybody in this room or, or watching online who has yet to receive you as their Savior, who don't, don't know firsthand what that's like to have that kind of relationship with you. Lord, I pray that even right now they'd open their hearts and their lives to you. They'd invite you to be a part of them. That they'd receive the forgiveness that you offer. They would put their trust in you and say, I trust you. I want to follow you. Forgive me of my sins, cleanse me, give me this new life. And the Lord, I pray that when they do that, everything would change in a moment. They would experience the reality of what it means to be a new creation. Lord, would you pour your spirit out on them? Would you let them experience the love that only you can provide and give them the peace that passes all understanding and the hope and the joy, Lord, that we, it's only possible to have in a relationship with you. And Lord, for the rest of us that are maybe your followers already, I pray that we would live our lives in such deep fellowship and connection and communion with you that we experience that kind of peace and joy that this scripture talks about. Lasting joy and peace even in the midst of trouble. That when things are feeling chaotic or feeling difficult, we have this deep abiding sense of peace that because you're with us in this moment, I can handle this. That, that you plus me means I can, we're going to be fine. We're going to get through this. You're going to bring something good out of this. So Lord, I pray that that would be the case for, for each of us, Lord, and that um, we would abide in you like your word talks about, that these good things that our life can produce and these these, these feelings of joy and peace, that they come from a connection to you. We are not meant to live our lives in this isolated, independent, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps kind of way, but we are to live our lives rooted in you. 
And Lord, if our, if our lives don't look like that right now, I pray that you would help us to um, repent of that. To say, I, I repent of my own self-reliance. I need you. I need you every hour in every aspect of my life. I want to submit my life completely to you. I'm going to open book before you, God. Mold me to the image of your son. Transform me. Lord, if, help us with this. Lord, help us to know you more. Help us to follow you more closely. Help us to walk in fellowship with you. And may you just, may you just pour out that peace and joy on us as we do that. Lord, you are good. We are so grateful that we can live our lives in relationship with you, in fellowship with you, that we don't need to ever be alone because you're with us. You promise to never leave us nor forsake us. So Lord, we love you. We praise you for these great promises and truths. And help us now as we lift up our voices in worship one final time together this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. 